Today's text will be taken from St. Matthew chapter 21. Verses 1 through 17 is the entire text. I'm not reading 17 verses. I will only read verses, I believe it's 8 and 9. Now I'm going to read verse 9 and 10. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved saying, who is this? And let me add verse 11. And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Lord, we pray your blessings today, anointing on this word as it is proclaimed. Let it be so done by the Holy Spirit that our hearts will be edified and that we will understand this day as the first day of the beginning of Jesus' last week of ministry on earth. What a significant day in the world. Bless us as we worship in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The king is coming. If we were to study the scripture and St. Matthew, we would be reading about uh, the cleansing of the temple and his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and how the people were putting down palm branches and spreading their garments before him, seeing him as the king. But how, oh, how quickly things changed. For just a few days later, instead of welcoming him, welcoming him in as the Messiah, they were shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. How quickly their chance changed from Hosanna to crucify him. But this was the final week of Jesus' ministry. And it's the beginning of the triumphal entry. And it's a prelude to much that has happened. This particular week, as well as throughout eternity, the king is coming. Jesus was entering Jerusalem. And during this time there, he decided to cleanse the temple. Believe it or not, we come now to the last week of Jesus' ministry on earth. Everything from now on takes place during that final week. And much of it isn't about the cross. It's not about Easter. That much at all. Much of it is some powerful final teachings that Jesus shared with his disciples. This includes the end of the world teachings about the end of the world that is forthcoming. In chapters 24 and 25 of St. Matthew, it sounds like the book of Revelation at that point. And I believe Jesus is speaking directly 
to us today about things we see going on right here and right now in this present life. Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem. And he's going there to present himself as the Passover lamb, the lamb of, of the Passover. He knows what lies ahead of him. He's fully aware of the events that are coming this week. He knows what's going to take place. But he enters Jerusalem anyway. People from all over are converging on Jerusalem from all directions. Two to three million people perhaps from everywhere coming to see the king, the Messiah, having a parade and everything for him, spreading palm branches and their garments. Imagine the crowded streets everywhere you look. Up until now, Jesus has for the most part avoided the big crowds and he has kept a low profile trying not to attract too much attention. He didn't want obviously what God had planned for his life to become complicated by the crowds of people. But now he comes front and center. He's no longer trying to keep a low profile. He comes front and center with the crowd and he allows his disciples to announce him as the Messiah. He's not holding back anything now. Tell the crowd that I am the Messiah. Why? He's moving things toward or in the direction of his ultimate. He wants things to start shaping up to lead to his ultimate rejection by the religious leaders putting the wheels in motion for his ultimate sacrifice. From this point on in the week, chaos ensues. Their whole week was chaos. His triumphal entry, his accusation, his flogging, all his rejection, his trial, his being found guilty, hung on a wooden cross. This was a week of chaos for Jesus, but he knew it was the will of God for the salvation of the world, the entire world, amen, without such a death and sacrifice, there would be no eternal life. So then, Jesus is in full control of what's taking place in his life this final week of his ministry on earth. He's guiding all things. He's still in charge. Nothing that's happening is beyond his control. God has it all in control. Jesus had it all in control. And today, believe it or not, we have people in Washington, in the White House, in the West Wing, in Congress, in both houses, amen, the Senate and the House, because of their political power, because of their finances, because of their positions, Believe it or not, these people think they are in control, but they are not in control 
They only are doing what God permits them to do. The UN may think the United Nations the same as those in the European Union or even the people in Russia or in the Middle East. Those who follow Allah may think they're guiding where the world is going, but believe me, they're not. God is still on the throne. Amen. Praise the Lord. And the king's heart is still in the hand of the Lord. Jesus said in St. John 10, he says, no man taketh my life from me. Does that sound like somebody that is out of control? Jesus says, no man taketh my life, but I lay it down. Aren't you glad that Jesus was obedient to his Father God. That Jesus loved us enough that he gave his life freely for our sins. He said, I lay my life down. No one took my life from me. He wasn't a victim. This wasn't something that just happened to him beyond his control. He was not a victim. He was not even a martyr. He died for our sins. He gave his life. But he wasn't a martyr. But he is the loving, sacrificial Savior of the world. Let's look at his preparation before entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Let's look at his preparedness. He just didn't all of a sudden decide to enter Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. There were things that led up to this day in the world's events. Let's look at the king's preparation for this week's events. All his earthly life, he was preparing, getting ready for the events to come in this week. Did they come as a surprise to him? No. All of Jesus' life, he was living, he was preparing, he was planning, he knew this was going to take place. And it quickly becomes evident that he is ready. Amen. The arrest, he was ready. The trial, he was ready. The condemnation, he was ready. The accusations, he was ready. The flogging, the ridicule, and the crucifixion, he was ready. He was prepared. He has the power to fulfill prophecy. He is fulfilling the pro prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. This is just one example of how the prophecies about Jesus and his coming were fulfilled, was fulfilled. Zechariah 9 and 9 says, Rejoice greatly. This was before Jesus was born. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout. O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, the king cometh unto thee. Even Zechariah predicted this. Way back in the book of Zechariah, long before Jesus was born, it was prophesied. Jesus was prepared before he was even born into the world. He has always existed. Jesus was prepared for this day. Amen. The king cometh unto thee. He is just talking about Christ and having salvation. He has made salvation possible. He was lowly, yes, 
and riding upon an ass and upon a coat, the foal of an ass. Did this come as a surprise to Christ? No, it was predicted by the prophet Zechariah long before Jesus' birth. Mark it down just as surely as they were the prophecies about the second coming will come to pass. The second coming will come to pass just like the prediction in Zechariah. Christ is coming back. Amen. And he's coming back anytime on a cloud for his own, for the redeemed, for the blood washed, for those that have come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior, those that have repented. Christ is coming back again just as it has been written. Let's look a little more at his preparation. He has the power to control nature. Jesus did. Yes, he did. Verses 2 and 3. Just as God allowed a donkey to speak in the Old Testament, he made this unlikely situation, Jesus' crucifixion, work out. Further, Mark's gospel says this donkey had never been written before. First time, he was still a wild animal. It's not tame. And I can tell you, you had to have had dominion over the animals as Jesus, their creator, for this thing to work out, to ride on the back of a wild donkey. But it worked to the glory of God. The donkey was calm. He didn't buck. He didn't throw Christ off. He didn't try to avoid what was going on. A wild animal God permitted to work to his glory. To do this, to ride on the back of a wild donkey. You'd have to be able to walk on water, calm a storm, or heal with a touch. Jesus had the power to do it all. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's the king's preparation. Jesus had been preparing for this day, Palm Sunday, all of his life, even before he went back to heaven. Amen. This was in God's plan. Now let's, let's look at the king's presentation, how he and what he presented. We see Jesus here in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Not as a king, but not seen as a king. Not riding a chariot. Not having a sepulcher in his hand. Not a number of horses pulling the chariot. People walking before him, centuries and guards, and people walking behind him. An unusual sight of a king entering Jerusalem, praise the Lord. But we see Jesus in his loneliness. Amen. This king is on a donkey, not a chariot. The Roman authorities were used to royalty, but never like this. Amen. It was a king, but he didn't have the resemblance of a king. The Jews had had kings before, but none of them had been as common or as lowly as Jesus. The red carpet is replaced with branches from the trees and the people shed their clothing. Where's the red carpet treatment? Not for this king, no doubt. Some scoffed at the idea of Jesus' parade. Some king this is, they may have been uttering 
and thinking. They may have said as they looked as the parade went by. I imagine Zacchaeus being in the parade. You know who Zacchaeus was, a little short man that climbed the sycamine tree to get a good look at Jesus as he entered. Zacchaeus no doubt said, I remember being in the parade. I used to be dishonest, Zacchaeus said. But now, no more. He's recognizing Jesus as the king, the savior of the world. The one that has given him eternal life. And there's the man that changed me. That's who changed my life, Zacchaeus said. He's lowly, but look what he did for my life. Blind Bartimaeus could say, I once was blind, but now I see. Every one of us here today, before we became a child of God, all of us were spiritually blind. Amen. But thank God for Jesus because he now has given us spiritual insight. We're no longer spiritually blind, but we are spiritually, amen, spiritually uh, alive and we can see because of Christ. The maniac of Gadara was in the parade, could be in the parade, but he's a different man. You know the story of the maniac of Gadara who used to go out and destroy him and then just a wild animal. But the crowd still thinks this maniac of Gadara, if he had been in the crowd, he must be crazy to follow this guy. Everybody that was following Christ, some had a reason to praise him, to lift his name and to glorify him. But some of them thought people must be crazy to follow this man into Jerusalem. Beggars, harlots, outcasts. These are the kind of people that could have marched with him along the parade route, singing his praises while onlookers made fun of such a bunch of followers as this. But these are the people that Jesus had touched. Gee, these are the people that Jesus had healed. These are the individuals that God had uh, allowed to be delivered from disease and, and, and para, uh, being paralyzed. This was the crowd that followed Jesus because they knew he was the king, the prince of peace, the son of the living God, the savior of the world. And our world is still laughing today. But I for one am proud, glad to be a part of that Jesus parade. Aren't you glad to be a part of the Jesus parade? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And if Jesus was walking down Stanton Avenue today, Hallelujah. Wouldn't you be proud and honored to be a part of the parade following him? I would. Amen. Because if it had not been for Jesus, we could say, I was blind and I'm still blind. I'm a beggar. I'm an outcast. But Jesus, the son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, the king that came to Jerusalem saved me, praise the Lord. And I'm a new creature in Christ. Like Paul, I want to say aloud, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So we see Jesus in his lowliness. Now let's look at him in his loftiness, his elevation, him being set apart, set above, set high 
Let's look at him in his loftiness. In verse 9 of this text, these are the quotes from Psalms 118. Not all of these people are dedicated followers. Many of these are fickle crowds following who in a few days will cheer on his crucifixion. What a fickle crowd. On Sunday, Hosanna, Hosanna. And on Friday, crucify him. Fickle crowd. How quick they had changed their mind about Christ. He's a different man. Amen. Praise the Lord. This crowd, this crowd is fickle. Yes, they are. But Jesus' loftiness stands out. Many of them will now change their chant from Hosanna to crucify him. Let's look at the king's proclamation. In verses 12 through 13, here's some background of his proclamation, what he has proclaimed. In those days, you went to the temple for one reason, which was to make an animal sacrifice. This, why you, this is why people went to the temple in those days, to sacrifice their animals. But their sacrifice had to be approved by the temple priest. He had to approve it. The priest started setting up shop in the temple, selling sacrifices at high prices, gouging people, cheating people, stealing from people. Praise the Lord. Or they wouldn't accept their money and would make them exchange for a big loss, robbing the people. Israel was supposed to be in the light of the world, amen, but had become a dark place. It was no longer, Israel was no longer the light of the world. It's now a dark place, a place where sin is rampant. Even the priests in the temple are crooked, hallelujah. Amen. But Jesus comes to the temple. The temple was supposed to be about missionary work. But now it's indulged in mercenary work. Cheating and robbing and stealing. Jesus was livid. Some picture him so meek and mild they make him into a whip. Amen. They think he's just soft. He's meek and he's mild. That is what church should be. Amen. Amen. But we see Jesus on this occasion. Amen. He was a man's man. Jesus was not a wimp. Jesus was not a sissy. He was a man's man. Amen. And when he wanted to make a point, he made it even with the money and goods flying throughout the temple that he cleansed. On another occasion, he used a whip and drove them out of his father's house. And he said, the temple was a place of worship and not for a den of thieves. Suddenly now we see Jesus healing people. His proclamation. Now that that's where he is meek and that's where he's mild. If it was anything meek and mild about Christ, it was his compassion. It was his love. It was his ability to heal, to save to set free, hallelujah. If anything was meek and mild about Christ, it was his compassion of love. Praise God. This is what our churches ought to be about people finding help and finding healing in our midst. Verse 13 says the church is a place of prayer 
but some won't stay long enough to pray. Praise the Lord. Verses 15 through 16 speak of a place of praise. And the church is and should be a place of praise. And our prayer should be may it ever be that. God may Stunton Avenue ever be a place of praise. Ever be a place to give you glory. Ever be a place of worship. Ever be a place of fellowship. Ever be a place where people can come and feel the presence of God and feel that they are in the presence of God, can feel the power of God, can feel the love and the compassion of God. May the church ever be such a place. The king is coming. But now we can say assuredly that the king is here. The king is here. He will reign forevermore.